Good. Uh, welcome, everybody. I'm Thomas Neeson. I'm managing partner at Condal, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the sixth in our series of six webinars relating to issues on sustainability and health and well-being. Uh, today, our subject is light and design evolution of the workplace. Maybe it should be called evolution of the workspace because everyone's working in different spaces than they have been, say, two months or three months ago, depending on what part of the world you're in. Uh, if you're in Western Australia at the moment, and I know we've got people attending from all over the world, you'll likely to be back in your office because uh, Western Australia and Perth have returned to work and all their locations in Australia are returning to work at the moment. I think it'll take a little bit, in fact, a lot longer in Europe and the UK and Ireland to get to that position, but we'll see how things develop. We're getting information, good information back from all of our offices globally all of the time. Uh, we're obviously meeting in very challenging times, but one time uh, and hopefully not too distant future, we'll get over COVID and then we'll go back to work. And when we go back, it'll be interesting to see what normal is. I'm not sure that normal will be what normal was before we got into COVID. And it'll be really interesting to see how the workspace develops for everyone. Um, and Andrew, who's our speaker today, will be able to touch on this and how it uh, may evolve and change for everyone. Uh, at Condal, sustainability is at the heart of all we do. And this is providing sustainable workspaces as well as one of our four cornerstones, looking at how we influence things in our homes and communities, in our workplaces, in our projects, and how we provide thought leadership. And our webinar today is one of our series of six in trying to provide some thought and industry leadership on specific subjects and really uh, hoping that you join in and give us your help by letting us have your thoughts and questions and ideas. Our seminar will run for about 30 minutes. Andrew's got lots he wants to tell you. We'll have a question and answer panel at the side so you can join in. Please give us your thoughts, any ideas you've got, and then we'll have a discussion at the end. Don't be afraid to ask questions. If we run out of time, we will email the answers to your specific questions. Today's speaker, Mr. Andrew Bissell. Andrew's given me a, a really proper professional bio on all the things that he does, and I'm not going to use any of that because uh, the alternative is much more interesting. Um, he's a very interest, He's a very um, keen Welsh rugby fan, so if you've got any rugby questions, um, please get those on the screen as well. Uh, don't Still ask the him. current Six Nation holders, I'd just yeah. like to point out. Well, yeah. Yeah. Don't ask him who's going to win this year's championship because everybody knows <laughs> Ireland are going to come good at the end. <laughs> Um, Andrew Andrew does his best work uh, when you're all asleep. He's not a cat burglar. He's uh, uh, quite often found in the middle of the night setting up some really interesting lighting installations. His very early career uh, was spent setting up uh, lights on motorways and A roads, and he's moved on inside buildings, but also out, outside buildings and setting up some fantastic installations in exhibition spaces on outdoor artworks, major sculptures, all types of light. And he's got a great expertise across lots of different uh, sectors and property types and building types. And of course, office lighting is a big part of it because it's where a lot of us spend our day-to-day -day existence. So without any further ado I'll, and delay, I'll hand you over to Andrew and then we'll get together again at the end, take your questions and talk about the webinars we've got coming up after this. So thank you for your attendance and over to Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Thomas. Uh, I'll just um, point out that we've got uh, part two of the returning to work post COVID uh, webinar coming up uh, next Monday. Uh, if you want to see part one, we can uh, point you in the direction uh, to our YouTube channel uh, where you can catch up with that but uh, please do sign up for the part two and we also have uh, a back to work document pointing out all of the services we can offer uh, in terms of uh, getting people back into the workplace and uh, maximizing uh, safety and the numbers of people who can uh, do that so again get in touch if you'd like to know more about that. We've been uh, presented, as we all know, with uh, quite a unique uh, experience uh, due to COVID. Um, the slide here used to say we had 23 offices. It now says we have 950 offices. And that's, that's had its challenges, clearly, um, for people, um, IT, mentally, etc. Uh, it's had its challenges, but it also provides us with opportunities. And it was 
the opportunity of learning more about people and how they work at home when they're given more choice. Sometimes they don't have choice due to the, uh, the homes they have and the circumstances they have, but it, it gave us an opportunity and, and that's what we'll talk about today. Um, the surveys we've done, the research we've done, and how we think that might change what we, what we do going forward. First off, though, I'll, I'll touch briefly on um, circadian light in health and light, and I don't want to go into too much detail. There's plenty of webinars out there, uh, including our own, on, on this subject. But essentially, circadian light is, is this link between light and health and well-being, how light impacts on how we produce cortisol and therefore how we produce melatonin. That therefore helps us sleep. And the better sleep we have, the, the more healthy and uh, we are. So the, there's, a, there's a known link. It was found in 1991. And since about 2000, uh, many different uh, practitioners, um, including lighting designers, have been pushing this link. Um, and it's something uh, that has come to the fore uh, in the last five years. And I think it's something we'll see um, focused much more in our workspaces going forward. But there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, if you want to know more, please get in touch. What I will also talk about uh, is the history uh, of lighting and, and what those key changes have been through the years. What have the drivers been that have changed workplace lighting? And obviously, I think home working will be another key change, which we'll come on to. What we've then done uh, during this period is to survey our staff initially in the UK, but then also uh, Australia and Asia uh, to learn about how people are working at home, what's working, what isn't, what their environment is like. And on the back of that, we've sent out further questions and we'll continue to do so, such that we can start to fine tune the responses and truly understand um, what people are, are experiencing eventually and what they want to see when they come back to the office. And then finally, we have uh, put all of that together into a proposal for how we may change the Manchester office layout um, in order to take on board as, as many of this uh, as many of these findings as we possibly can. So that's the process of what we'll go through today. So moving into the, the history, um, for a long, long time, light and design was very much uh, visual only. It was about how much light do, do we need to put on the working plane, the horizontal working plane, in order that people can see what they need to do. Um, and, and this is a good example, recessed light fittings spread across the office. Um, can, can I see what I need to do? And, and this is how office lighting um, was undertaken for many, many years. A step change was the introduction of visual display units, curved glass screens into offices in around the 90s. And this introduced a problem of reflective glare on the screen. People couldn't see the text because they could see the light fitting in the background. And so it, it made a small change to how office spaces were illuminated in the sense that uh, the manufacturers introduced a category rating for their louvers, category one, two, and three louvers that controlled that glare. But essentially, from a lighting perspective, um, the lighting design was still just about numbers on the horizontal plane. It was visual. It wasn't touching on how the space looked. It wasn't really touching on the bio biological aspects of, of light and what it could do for us. Then we move into 2000s. This is where we started to see rating tools appear. And the focus suddenly became on the energy efficiency. So the solution itself was still about how much light is on the working plane, but there was also a now an added factor, how efficiently could we deliver that light to the working plane? Can we uh, increase the space in between fittings and reduce the number of fittings, reduce the number of fluorescent lamps, etc.? cetera? Um, and it was all about the energy efficiency, but it didn't really change um, the fact that we were only designing visually uh, and numerically. But of course, we then saw 2010 era where we had tech companies come along and they recognised that their staff uh, were doing different tasks in different areas. And also their staff were expecting the spaces to look different. They were that kind of character that, that they didn't want this uh, one size fits all, one light everywhere kind of approach. And so the desk was illuminated differently to the meeting room, to the kitchen, to the reception, to the corridor, because different tasks were taking place. And we started to see, to see some of this spill beyond the tech industry, although predominantly it was the tech industry that went down this route. And this was the first time you started to see visual and emotional lighting solutions, uh, solutions that were dealing with both uh, of those aspects of lighting. 
And then we arrived 2014, 2015. And what was really interesting here, as I mentioned before, circadian lighting was identified, um, or the link between light and health was identified in 1991. Uh, it was then being talked about a lot from 2000 onwards, and different manufacturers had different products, and different people were, were advocating how we could actually achieve this circadian lighting solution. But it wasn't until the well standard came along and actually made it one of its elements so that you no longer looked at the horizontal lighting on the working plane. You actually started to look at the vertical light that was arriving in somebody's eye and you needed to achieve a certain level in order that you could uh, say that you had satisfied this circadian lighting requirement. And what that did, it still meant we were designing visually and emotionally so that we were still putting different light and into different types of spaces because that's the, the right thing to do. But we were also being much more careful about where the lights were positioned to make sure they were, they were positioned to benefit people biologically. Ideally, we do that through daylight, but as you get deep plan offices, it can all be done through daylight. And, um, and so... For the first time, I'd say uh, we started to see uh, the majority of our projects thinking about the logical and the emotional aspects of lighting. And, and that's how it's been. And that's the predominantly the type of way, uh, lighting installation and solution that we work on at the moment. But of course, as we mentioned, we've suddenly got there's 950 uh, people approximately at home, all of us with different scenarios. Nobody's been sent home with light fittings, you know, everyone's using what they have at home. And we felt this is a great opportunity to understand um, what people have chosen to do. Um, so, and to find out whether people have got something unique that they're doing that they would like to see when they come back to the office. So we set up uh, a home working light and experience survey. To date, we've had 261 uh, people respond. We took a snapshot as to this presentation when it was at 249. So there are the results you'll see. There are more results coming in all the time and we're also adding questions uh, as, as we get feedback. Where we've also used this um, information is that in the Manchester office, we were already looking at, uh, we were doing a piece of research to look at whether we could deliver circadian light into every desk, so uh, vertically at every eye. Um, just using daylight alone within the office space. And so we have a wealth of data in terms of who sits where and how much uh, natural light they will receive on an overcast day, a sunny cast day, on the hour, every hour. Um, and so we were, we've been able to uh, compare what those people have at home with what we know they have in the Manchester office as well. We've also got data for London. We haven't just prepped that yet, but we'll look into that as well. What we've also had is Public Health England came to the office for a couple of days uh, two years ago and undertook measurements on the electric lighting and the natural lighting, and they've provided some great feedback um, on what we have now and what we could do. And I'll come on to some of that later in terms of how it's influenced uh, what, how we think about the way we design going forward. So looking at um, one of the questions we asked, how far are you sat from uh, a window with daylight? We didn't expect people to be far from a window. You know, uh, people, a uh, typical room, four metres, five metres, if, you, if you're lucky and doing well. Um, so it wasn't a surprise to see how close uh, people were sitting to uh, a window. But when you then compare that to where people sit uh, in relation to a window in the office, so we've got here 85% of the people are within three metres, 95% of the people are, are within four metres. That's certainly not what we have currently. So even Manchester, which is quite narrow plan with daylight from two sides, almost east and west, um, we've, we've still got people sat six metres from a window. So in terms of giving people that home working experience, um, clearly we need to get people closer to the window. How do we do that? And what do you do with the space um, that, that's perhaps left over in the middle of the office or um, within a deeper plan you're going to push people towards uh, the window. The second question was to ask which way people face. So the ISO standards, the lighting guides, um, well standard, all to talk about being perpendicular to the window. Uh, you don't get glare onto your screen. Um, you're not looking straight out of the window, which can be problematic if it's a bright sky against your laptop or your screen image. Um, and so it's good to see over half of the people are able to sit in a way that's uh, recommended. 
But this is where the Public Health England information comes in, that they had taken measurements in our office where people sit perpendicular to the window. And they had said about 15% of the staff weren't receiving the circadian lighting they needed from daylight alone. They had to have the electric lighting. However, if we just angled those people slightly, not so they're not looking out of the window, but they're just angled towards the window, it would significantly increase uh, the amount of daylight arriving at their eye. And therefore, we could start to have much fewer desks where people uh, weren't able to have uh, circadian lighting from daylight alone. So some useful feedback which we've put into uh, our solution later on. And then we also asked how long do people have the electric lights on for? Now this survey initially went out to uh, the UK staff first and we saw over 50%, I think it's 52% of people had no electric light in use at all during the day. Um, as this has then been sent out to Australia and Asia, and in fact, the latest figures show that 45% of people are, have no electric lighting at all. But what we have seen is, is a huge increase in, in how many people have the light on for eight hours a day. Um, I was talking to my colleague, uh, Bettina, who heads up uh, Light4 in Australia, and Oscar, who heads up Light4 in Asia. And I was talking to them about why this might be the case because these are brighter countries they have more uh, sunlight they have more daylight and there were, there were two um, findings really one was that in australia they tended to have more uh, planting and trees outside the properties for solar shading and therefore that's reducing the amount of uh, electric light that's coming in and so although it's bright outside not much of that light is coming in and secondly because the window does look bright because it's so bright outside um, you needed to have your electric lighting on to make it feel bright inside. So it was a contrast issue. So that's been quite interesting. And I don't think we'd have um, yes, say uh, um, uh, the brighter countries would use more electric lighting. So that's something to look into. But regardless of that slight difference between the UK, Australia and Asia, um, what we can say is the majority of people um, have no electric lighting uh, or very minimal use of electric lighting during the day. So how do we bring that into our office spaces um, if that's what they're experiencing at home and that's what they're enjoying because daylight has a quality about it that can't be replaced by electric lighting. So some other key findings, um, people don't like the big light, a bit of a piece of K reference there, nobody likes the big light, put the big lights on. People were saying in the feedback that even if it gets dark, they're not turning to the big light to improve the lighting in the space. Or if they are doing, they've actually made it an up light. So they have just a, a diffuse light onto the soffit. So the space feels bright. They'd much rather have something that's uh, smaller, that's local to them, that they can move. We've already picked up on where people are sat by the window and the use of electric light. But something else that came out of the survey is that 45% of people, um, their dominant view is nature. So that included asking them uh, how much of the sky they can see, trees and fields. Um, so 45% of people, uh, their dominant view is nature. Now, can we give them that currently in the office space uh, that we have around the world? Well, we can't everywhere. So how do we go about giving people that? So when they get back from home to the office, um, they feel that they've got that same quality of environment uh, because that is important to them. We've already touched on Australians using more light. And these were two uh, key points as well in terms of the, the lighting control, the blind control, glare control, etc. They've got choice and, and they've got control. And, and one of the key things about the control was it's very easy. I can reach the light switch. I know how to use a light switch and therefore I use it. I turn my lights on and off as and when I need them. And likewise with choice, we had some people who were sitting in an east facing room in the morning, a west facing room in the evening. They were following the sun, they were tracking the sun. And I'm sure there'll be some people who will do, do the opposite and they'll like daylight, but they will want the direct sunlight. It, and it was the fact they've got choice. So how do we introduce that into uh, the post COVID environment? Some don't have an office space. So uh, this was a, a short article we did on LinkedIn uh, a couple of weeks ago, bring back the spare room. So, you know, years ago we used to have the spare room or the box room and that would now make an ideal home office. Um, modern apartments, modern homes don't tend to have that spare room or that box room. And is that something that developers need to start to think about? Uh, this was a common one, get up and move around. Um, people weren't taking their phone calls 
at their desk, whether that's in the kitchen or the lounge, or if they do have a study, they were actually getting up and going outside to take that phone call. And it's easy to do in your home. You may be walking 10 metres, maybe 20 metres, and you're outside and you're wandering around your garden if you have a garden. So um, how do we introduce that into the, the post-COVID office? Those who walked to work missed their commute, and those who drove or used public transport tended not to miss their commute too much. This is not an exhaustive survey. Obviously, the predominant part of the survey was lighting, but we did have some other feedback in terms of uh, their commutes. Um, and then again, these two are interesting. I miss the team communication, chatting and banter, um, but I'll miss the peace and quiet um, that I have at home. So how do we give people both of those things? within the working environment when they come back to the office. So looking briefly at the Manchester office, um, before we get on to how we might go about changing that, we focused when we refurbished this uh, three or four years ago on putting everyone sat in, in the right-hand side of the office with meeting rooms and breakout spaces in the left-hand side. And we felt it was important that everybody was sat together um, on one side of the office. And so this, this is effectively the layout. And the lighting follows very much what we saw in the image for 2015. The lights are over the desk, so everyone's got light where they need it. We've got up lighting between the desks so that the ceiling appears bright. It's all on daylight link and it's all on uh, passive infrared. We have um, separate lighting down the corridor and a different type of lighting for the hive and for the meeting rooms. And so we've, we've, we're ticking those, the, the visual, the biological, and the emotional boxes. We're ticking all of those boxes in this space. And it's a great scheme. And, and it works well. Um, but if we were to take what we've learned from the survey we've done so far, and I'm sure what we'll learn going forward from other people as well, is that how we would have um, laid out the office and lit the office um, uh, for, for a post-COVID or for uh, um, a more home working, office working mix. So we've started to look at how we may lay out an office and in particular how we might light an office and what that means to the different people involved the developers landlords tenants and, and end users and where we where we came to was the first thing we said is well we must have this home zone we must try and fit everybody within this three or four meter zone from the window how do we get everybody into that area so we had 70 people previously in the office all in the right hand side in this layout here, what we've said is, whilst the meeting rooms and hive um, and, and uh, um, the, the breakout spaces on the left-hand side were nice to have, actually for a lot of the time they were empty, when really we could have had more people sat closer to the window. So what we've done is created this home zone along the facade, and we've put all 70 people back along that facade area. And this then means the most number of people are sat close to the daylight for the majority of the day and actually in splitting up the office in this way if you want that open communication you can have that more so on the right hand side and if you want that privacy you can have that more so on the left hand side so choosing where you sit based on the task you've got to undertake that day um, is possible now whereas previously everybody was in the in the same space what we've then introduced and we'll you know have to talk to the landlord about this and the structural engineers um, is let's have a, a, a back garden. So let's break through that gable end wall. Let's have some openable windows. If it's a bit cold outside, it's a bit cold in there. If it's a bit warm, it's a bit warm. And let's have that space where you can wander to to make that call or you sit there uh, at lunchtime or you sit there in the evening, but that's south facing. So let's actually benefit from that. Let's, let's go to that space um, and let's enjoy that space for what it is. Um, and, and create it more in a natural environment and in a natural way. And as I said, let's not try and control the temperature too closely. Let's uh, allow it to be what it is. Um, so we have the back garden, similar to you have at home. And then what we've done with the centre of the space, this is where all of the other elements would now sit, that where you spend only a short period of time, whether that's the kitchen, whether it's a server room pod, whether it's a meeting room pod, whether it's a telephone booth pod. So you have these series of different types of spaces in, in the centre, um, making use of that area which is furthest from the daylight in. And different offices and different businesses will need different amounts of meeting rooms and pods, but essentially the home zone is for where people spend the most of the time. We have the back garden and then we have the pods providing those additional uh, functions down the centre. So what does it mean for a lighting point of view? Well, what we would do differently here is 
in the home zone, we would have no big lights. We wouldn't put anything on the ceiling at all. We would look to do everything at the desk level. We would look to make everything local so that they have the control. And perhaps they even have the choice of the type of desk lamp they want. Uh, maybe that it's not fixed about what desk lamp they want, but they have the choice, the people have the choice of the desk lamp. But essentially, from a landlord's point of view, not to put any lighting on the soffit in, in that area is, is what we're saying, which is going to save money um, initially in the build, and it's going to save energy in the sense that we just don't want that lighting on. What we're saying for the central area then is to have some up lighting and to just provide a, a bright feel into that space. So if we up light that soffit, perhaps mounting the lighting on the columns, we can create a bright feeling in that space um, and it's not going to look like an office as such. The lighting within the pods would actually be, be part of the pod design itself. So as you need an extra pod, you plug it in and away you go. It's got everything there that you need. Um, and outside of that space, you've got up lighting and it's a little more natural. It might get a little bit darker between two pods and be a little bit brighter between the other pods. And what we were missing was the hive space, the open plan space for, for having an event. And by effectively having these pods on wheels, we can move them out of the way, unplug them, move them out of the way and have the event in the middle of the office space. So we haven't lost it. We're just uh, thinking differently about it. And for the back garden, um, it would very much be about uh, providing a, a token level of feature lighting for when it's needed in the winter. In, in the winter, but we wouldn't be looking to provide uh, um, much lighting in there again. So, all in all, um, there's a lot less lighting being put into this space because we've pushed people towards the daylight, um, and we're going to make use of the daylight that we have within this space. Um, I appreciate we're blessed uh, double aspect lighting here. Um, and it will change. The solution will change for different depths of offices and different aspects. But this is the principle, the home zone, the back garden and the spare room pods. From a, a light and energy point of view, uh, initial calculations are showing that we can get this down to about half a watt per meter squared uh, for the lighting installed within this space. So a, a good BCO office might be four to six watts per meter squared, five to six watts per meter squared at the moment. So uh, considerable saving in energy as well. We went one step further, um, having laid it out, and we took on board the feedback that we'd had about choice and control. And we started to look at two of the current problems with blinds and electric lighting. If you have a blind in the window and there are six or eight people who rely on that one or two window bays uh, for their natural lighting, when the person nearest the window pulls the blinds down, everybody loses the sunlight. And in particular, that impacts the person furthest away. So what we've looked at here is to have some um, acoustic panels mounted on a ball joint, that, almost like a, a sun visor in a car. You move them to suit yourself. So if the sun's in your way at a particular time, you move that visor um, such that you can block out the sun. But that's not having much of an impact on the person next to you, uh, only a small impact, certainly nowhere near the same as uh, pulling the, the blind down. And the person furthest away still has the benefit uh, of a view and in the evening um, they can be tucked away, cleaned, tucked away and uh, um, ready for the next person to sit by the window. What we've then also looked at is whether the lighting is mounted into those poles as well so it becomes a single element dealing with the sun glare, the acoustics and the lighting and you're in control of that so you're, the switches for those, for those lights are at the bottom it couldn't be easy you know which switch is which light and you can turn it on dim it up down and uh, do what you what you require with it so you're in control of your sunlight you're in control of your electric lighting as well and by putting the light close to the working surface it's very efficient uh, as well one of the thought we had was if people are going to get up and move around, let's say you're having a collaboration kind of morning, but you're having a report writing kind of evening, so you're going to move to a different desk, how do you have that uh, personal relationship? How do you have your things around you? And when we spoke to people, they've all got pictures or something that sits on their desk, you know, at squeeze ball. There's always something that sits on their desk. And we were looking at the idea of having iPads mounted either above or to the side. Um, on the desks such that they could just scroll through your images it knows that you're sat there so it scrolls through your family images it's got pictures of you in there um, but equally we could use them for communication so 
the lighting team tried one day to have a team meeting where um, we kept the team meeting open uh, just so we could overhear each other to see if we could feel that we were sat in the office together because it's fine when you deliberately phone somebody, but you're missing out on all those other thoughts and comments and, and bits of chat. <clears throat> and so we had this Teams meeting open, um, but it was a little bit bizarre because everybody was for the whole time. Um, so you're trying to work on one screen and everyone's staring at you on the other screen. But we felt with the iPads either up out of the way or to one side, you could have that permanent open connection with people who are at home and you would just turn and say, Hannah, Kenny, um, you know, what do you think of this? And they would immediately pop up. I mean, that's one for IT to look at. But it was this idea of trying to make the space personal, even though every space is the same, and that you actually might get up and move around um, the space in the future. So hopefully food for thought there. But the idea being there's no big lights there. There's some up lighting and some local lighting and no big lighting. And we're getting closer to this feeling of um, being at home and We've splayed the desks such that you are angled slightly more to the daylight in, and in the space between those splayed desks, we've then introduced the planting to give people uh, that closer link to uh, natural elements, et cetera. So to summarize really, what, what do we think that means to developers? Well, um, it, it will mean a, a need to focus on, on, on would you say guaranteeing views maybe you can't guarantee a view certainly the only the only thing you can do is you've got a right to light if you've claimed that right to light you you haven't got a right to a view but developers might need to think about how they perhaps can develop their site to protect those views if people have a view of nature now how do they have a view of nature going forward um how deep can or should the space be? And I appreciate there's a, a viability and financial model there, but how deep can the space be? For landlords, we're thinking actually put less of the lighting in, um, allow people to move in um, and put their own lighting in. And, and what we're saying, if we get people into this home zone around the perimeter of spaces, we don't need to have um, a flood of lights across the space. And that's got to be a good from a point of view of cost as well uh, as part of the cafe fit out and also a lot of those fittings are thrown away almost immediately when the tenant moves in anyway so it's got to be good from a waste and sustainability point of view for tenants are we going to see tenants walking into spaces and asking them themselves the question okay i've got a home zone and i can fit two-thirds of my staff or three-quarters of my staff into that but the rest won't be able to fit into the home zone in this space so what do i do um, um, do we move people around on a, on a regular basis or, or is this office just not for us? Um, tenants might start to look differently at office spaces. Can I give staff choice? Can I give uh, staff a window seat, uh, etc.? And for end users, it may be the difference when they walk between two offices uh, looking at employers, who can give them that experience most similar to what they enjoy about home, whilst also giving them the things that they benefit from being in an office um, so there's a little bit there for everyone who's involved in uh, office design and workplace design and building design um, and it'll uh, be interesting to hear um, questions and thoughts uh, from people based on on that thank you andrew um a few questions um how about the design of co-working spaces and how what's the approach the best approach for those ones it, it, yeah, it's interesting. That question came up as well this morning about co-working spaces. Um, I haven't been involved in, in any myself in terms of the, the, the lighting layouts and, and how they're set out. I've been into some. Um, and, and really, in some ways, they're, they're beneficial because you, you can turn up and almost choose where you want to sit. Um, so you, you do have that element of choice. Um, but... If they're taking deep spaces, deep planned spaces, and a large part of the entrance is taken up by the reception and, and perhaps a waiting area, then then you know people are being pushed away from um, the daylight. I don't think it's any different to a, a normal office. I think you know um, if people are enjoying access to daylight, sunlight, and views now at home, and they want that to continue when they get back to the office, they're going to have to look at perhaps which co-working space can offer that best. Okay, 
And um, God, there's a bit of <laughs> noise in there. Um, um, what about designing, well, doing the lighting design before the, the space is built? So can you, can we do trial outs and design the space virtually and then do all the tests and then go back to the client? Yeah. So this is where you're going to get virtually. Yes. Yeah, so so we we've looked at this whereby um, you don't actually install the lighting. You actually do three different designs that might suit three different types of clients, and you provide that information virtually, um, and then people can go and stand in the space um, with the virtual reality headset and look around and see. Option one costs X pounds per square foot. Option two costs X pounds per square foot. What I would say though is we have seen a, a huge shift towards tenants wanting their own lighting solution. I think we're, we've certainly seen a move away from people simply turning up to a space that's already lit and simply putting their desk down and doing a few tweaks. We've actually seen people taking lights out and actually preferring to take spaces which have no light in at all because then they have the freedom to do what they want. And from the point of view of, of creating a space that suits your business and your staff, a blank canvas is always better. I appreciate there's a timeline for moving into your space, but um, to suit your staff and your business, a blank yeah. canvas is, is almost always better. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know anything about the possible use of UV lighting to combat COVID? <laughs> if, if only I had a lamp that did that, yeah. There's a great document uh, released by the CIE just yesterday, uh, a position paper on all of the facts that are known uh, about UVC and COVID, and it really is, uh, the, the, I'd recommend people go and read that rather than uh, some of the, um, I guess you could describe it as fluffy stories around UVC. Some people have been very careful with their wording um, and making it appear as a UVC kills COVID, just put it into your air handling and off you go. There's more to it than that. And I would advise people to go and read that CIE paper. Um, it's very dangerous, obviously, UVC, uh, if people are around, so you've got to be careful. With that said, it's already being used in hospitals, um, and it has been used in theatres before. They tended to use mobile lamps so that you could actually move it around and make sure that you, you nowhere was in shadow and that uh, the pathogens weren't sitting somewhere else. Um, I think we'll see a huge development in, in that type of technology, but it's not there just yet. Um, but like I said, we'll, we can provide the link to the CIA documents um, and people can read that. Yeah, yeah. we'll do that. Um, in your Manchester office post-COVID layout, some desks were facing the windows. Would users of those desks not require the blinds closing frequently? Well, what we've looked at is that they're far enough back and they've also still got these uh, baffles either side of them that the percentage of the view of the window isn't so much that it's not your laptop and then a huge window. It's actually a monitor with a little bit of light. It's a good question though, it is a good question. And, and really that would come down to the fact that some people would be okay with that and some people wouldn't be okay with that. Some people need less light, some people need more light. So it's a good question because some people probably wouldn't like that particular seat. Um, but, but yeah, you certainly couldn't um, put a bench along the window and just put everybody on a bench looking out of the window. That, that would be very difficult for the eye to go. Okay. Do you think current office lighting standards will be revised in the near future to incorporate some more of these ideas and become more institutionally accepted? Yeah, I'd like to see that. I, I, I would have liked to have seen the last version of um, LG7 be a little bit more adventurous. Um, I think it could have done a little bit more uh, and been a little bit bolder in, in how it lights spaces. Um, we've got to get away from this idea of blanket lighting levels. And, and the document, to be fair, the Lighting Guide 7 does that. It does talk about the task area. Um, but I think people, uh, and I had a question yesterday, someone asked again, what uniformity should I provide over the entire working area of a Cat A office? Well, that number doesn't exist anymore, but people still think that way. So we've got to get away from that. We've got to start thinking about the task people are doing and where they're doing it, and we need to light for those people. Um, we've got to stop thinking about one light fitting suits everything and everyone everywhere. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, typical offices have loads, um, lots of meeting spaces and can be largely empty. Um, since we need currently social physical distancing, do we think all meeting rooms will be repurposed and we'll just all do meeting rooms from our workstations? I mean, that's how we're working at the moment. We're all doing our meetings from our workstations at the moment. Um, and certainly um, we were already doing that when we were in the office. We weren't always going to collective collect into a meeting room, even if you say, for example, three people from Manchester, we're going to be talking with two from London and, and two from Hong Kong. We might actually still all sit at our desk with our headphones all from Manchester go and sit in a meeting room. You can do, um, but you, you've got the choice. Um, so it, it's an easy one at the moment with the technology now, everybody used to the technology. You could quite easily put the desks in there and put a number of people in the meeting rooms. In fact, when we were refurbishing our office, um, some of us were sat in meeting rooms whilst we were shoveling people around and it worked, it was fine. So yeah, I can see that happening. Okay, and uh, one more, it's not actually a question, it's just a comment. Um, good to see the thinking on local acoustic control. I think that is going to be a really important driver of workstation design. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. The peace and quiet you get at home compared to an open plan office, um, even with good acoustics, the peace and quiet you get does help uh, to, to concentrate. So yeah, and the fact you can control it and close yourself in or open yourself up, I think that's uh, important, great. Um, those were all the, qu no, wait, sorry. Um, another factor with meetings is acoustic privacy. If you have a private meeting, this either needs to be done in an enclosed meeting room or from home. That's very oh, true. true. Yeah. yeah, very true. Um, I think that's Again, all for though, questions. Like question yeah, we did have... Would this. Be, Andrew, that sounds like an equation from an acoustician, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> But we do have the spare room pods and some of them can be your normal meeting rooms that you're used to so that when you get taken into a room for a chat, it's, it's private. Yeah. No, any more questions? Good. I don't think there's anything else. That's good. Thanks everyone for your questions. Thank you for the questions and for attending.